Our sort of view is that you know, cyberspace and all the rest of it is changing. And obviously, we all know, especially as ATI researchers, that everything you do now, there's some kind of digital record which is storing all of that data. And it's getting to the stage where people are starting to analyze the data and potentially um, use the data to change our experiences, change our sort of online world and increasingly offline world. Um, so what this talk is about is it's starting micro and I'm gonna speak for about 25 minutes about one example uh, where we've sort of got caught up in um, how these digital records can be used to affect our social world, our democratic world. Um, and then Professor Rust is going to talk uh, more broadly for the uh, 25 minutes after that around what might be underlying some of these effects, what are the actual trends happening, and therefore what might happen in the future as well. Okay, is that fair enough? Great. <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, yeah, again, thank you for coming. Um, so, I'm now in a business school. I used to be in a psychology department, but now that I'm in a business school, I'm encouraged to come up with a business case for why some of the stuff I do matters. Um, here's a few business examples where companies are looking at some of this online data, and they're making decisions about us, they're making um, predictions about us, and they're charging us different amounts depending on what some of our data says. So on your left, you've got um, uh, Admiral Car Insurance. So in November 2016, Admiral, to great fanfare, announced that um, they were going to offer people car insurance priced based on their Facebook data. Um, so what you do is you come along, you share your Facebook data, Based on that data, they would either give you a discount or not based on whatever they thought about you from that data. Uh, unfortunately for Admiral, they didn't talk to Facebook about this first. So about four hours later, the headline changed to this one to say that this thing was not going ahead and Facebook were blocking it. Um, but what is happening is um, in China, so WeBank um, is um, on the WeChat platform. So WeChat is um, a huge app in China. You can't really do anything uh, in China without coming across uh, WeChat. And what WeBank does is it gives people um, essentially credit card uh, loans. So loans, I think it's about 18% interest. Again, based on their social media behavior, which in their case is on the WeChat platform. Um, so they're giving people up to about 5,000 pounds based on just this WeChat data. Um, so then the question is, okay, what is this data that they're using? Why is it being used to predict these financial things with real consequences? And, you know, what might be going on behind the scenes that actually means that it makes sense? Um, and then later, talk about some implications for democracy. So I'll talk about how you can understand millions of people from digital footprints, and then some real-life applications um, where this can be used. Okay, so let's put it... Um, as intuitive as possible, and as I say, I uh, used to be in a psychology department, so I wouldn't be a proper psychologist unless I gave you a uh, psychological test. Um, so this test has two questions. Um, you don't have to put your hand up or anything like that because you don't know what this test might say about you, so maybe just think in your head what would you answer. Um, but the first question is, which celebrity do you prefer? So on your left, you've got Tom Cruise, A, and on your right, you've got Frank Sinatra, B. So just in your head, think, am I more of a Tom Cruise kind of person or a Frank Sinatra kind of person? All right. Second question, a little bit different. Uh, which word cloud do you feel most drawn towards, or at least sort of least repelled away from? Um, so uh, on your left, you've got words like uh, home, shopping, week, birthday, weekend, happy, uh, things like that. And on the right, you've got words like music, writing, universe, soul, uh, light, uh, zombie, dreams, world, art, things like that. Okay, so again in your head, am I more of a A side or a B side? Okay, so results coming up now. So you should have in your head A, A, B, B, A, B, B, A. Um, so here's the results. So in uh, psychology, there's a personality scale called openness. Openness distinguishes people who try new stuff, 
Uh, they're interested in artistic things. Um, you know, they would say that modern art is actually art, whereas maybe conservative and traditional people on the other side of openness would say, well, modern art is not really art. You know, unless it looks like something that makes sense to me, then uh, you know, this is not something I recognize as art. You know, just in general, more conservative and traditional. Um, and basically what the data shows, so this isn't sort of theory driven or anything like that, but what the data shows is that people who are using those words, uh, music, universe, dreams, art, tend to be more high on the openness scale. Uh, similarly, people who like Frank Sinatra tend to be high than uh, people who like the other ones. So here's some of the data. So we looked at people who literally like Frank Sinatra or Tom Cruise on Facebook. And you can see on five, uh, here are the five personality traits that are typically used. And the main difference between the two is on this openness um, trait. So um, you know, the fact that someone likes Tom Cruise over Frank Sinatra gives some evidence that they are higher on this openness trait. Um, so that's the kind of intuition I'm trying to get across to you. So the things you like on Facebook, um, the words that you use when you're talking to people, um, they don't sort of come about randomly, they come about for a reason, and that reason then suggests something about what you are as a person if you're using those kinds of things. Um, obviously this was just two questions. Um, each question has a very low reliability, so it's giving you a tiny piece of information. So if anyone got a result that they were hoping, you know, they, that they, they didn't want to get, then, you know, this is <laughs> just not that accurate, so don't worry about that. Um, but the gist is these tiny pieces of information can be built up into quite an accurate picture about you. Um, uh, okay, so I'm not going to go through the big five personality traits, but um, in psychology, basically, there are five numbers um, that uh, psychologists use to say, well, what makes one person do take one decision in a certain situation, but a different person, even though the same situation, takes another decision? So what is it about them that makes them unique? And these five numbers give a pretty good prediction if you know how extroverted someone is or how open-minded or how agreeable or whatever it is. Um, that gives you a pretty good prediction about what they're going to do in a particular situation. Um, here are the kinds of questions that come up. So when you actually um, take a personality test, um, people sometimes think, well, personality test is sort of a magical thing that you can never possibly understand. In reality, very, very simple. If you say, I make friends easily, if you say strongly agree, you get points towards being extroverted. If you say strongly agree, I don't talk a lot, you get points towards being introverted. You add up the points at the end, and you come up with some kind of um, score on this extroversion scale. Um, but the reason I share is, if you're thinking about someone's Facebook behavior, there's a lot of information on Facebook that can tell you the answers to some of these questions without having to actually ask the question. So if you look at someone's Facebook profile, I make friends easily, how many Facebook friends do they have? Uh, maybe giving you some information towards this kind of uh, response to that question. I'm the life of the party, or I would describe my experiences as somewhat dull. If you're looking at the events they're going to, if you're looking at the words they're using when they're talking to each other, um, you can sort of, you know, intuitively imagine that there's information there that would help you to answer those kinds of questions or to predict someone else's answer. Um, so this is, you know, not something sort of, uh, sometimes big data is seen as well. You can get something out of nothing. You know, there, there's a clear sort of intuitive reason why you'd expect to be able to use someone's big data to predict the results for these questions. Okay. Um, so we collected data... Um, on the Facebook platform by creating a Facebook app. And I was very fortunate in that in um, June 2007, um, I had nothing to do. I just finished my undergraduate. I was um, planning to go on to master's and PhD. And Facebook released its apps platform so that anyone could create an app and put it on their social network. Um, so I created an app called My Personality where it gave people a personality questionnaire and then gave them feedback on the results. And you could share your results with friends and all that kind of social stuff. Um, and because I was fortunate, you know, first mover advantage or whatever, um, lots of people started using it. You know, I didn't have to spend money on advertising. It went sort of viral in a way that things rarely actually go viral in the real world. Um, and over the next few years, we got data from about 6 million people. So we got a big data set about what makes people unique according to their answers on a personality test. And also, 
for those who opted in, and about a third of people did, we got data on what are they actually doing on Facebook, what are they doing online. So then you can start making these links between the two. Um, so here's one of the things that we looked at, um, which you know maybe psychologists would call an identity claim. Um, so uh, I wish my shirt had a, uh, uh, had a, had a logo or a product on it. Uh, a good shirt turns the wearer into a walking corporate billboard. Uh, it says to the world, my identity is so wrapped up in what I buy that I paid the company to advertise its products. Um, and it's always you know, it's worth thinking about you know, why, why do we pay extra to get Adidas? You know, why are we paying to tell everyone that uh, we're wearing Adidas or, or whatever the uh, brand is? You'd admit that, oh sure, endorsing products is the American way to express individuality, which is the kind of key thing. So if you're thinking about liking something on Facebook, so clicking that thumbs up icon, um, maybe you're liking something because you want to get updates from this brand. But another reason is because you want to tell everyone you know that I am the guy who likes Game of Thrones or I'm the guy who likes Coke or Pepsi or whatever it is. Um, you know, a bit like people have these fights to the death over Android versus iPhone. You know, there's something sort of wrapped up in identity where, you know, it makes it such a high stakes thing. Um, so if you want to know what someone is like, then looking at some of these identity claims gives you uh, good information. Um, so that's what we did. We uh, did the academic thing. We published a paper, can we predict people's psychological differences? So can we predict their scores on a personality test based on just their Facebook likes? So this wasn't taking into account anything else on Facebook. It's looking at what music do they like, what celebrities do they like, what uh, statements do they like? So plenty of people will like Jeremy Clarkson should be prime minister is a popular uh, Facebook page. Um, so we did the academic thing. We published a paper. Surprisingly for academics, um, some people read the paper. So I can show you what the media made of our results. Now, clicking like on Facebook is something most of us do without thinking. The University of Cambridge over in London actually Close did a enough. study of what people like on Facebook to try to determine uh, facts about them that they wouldn't otherwise know. So they didn't just look at the products, the, the movies, the bands that people like. They also looked at the status updates that people like, the photos that people like. And they were able to draw some really, really interesting conclusions about all of your likes that you're clicking can tell more about you than you might have realized, from your political values to your religion to your gender to your happiness to your age. In fact, some parts of your identity can be predicted with 95% accuracy. Accuracy was lowest, about 60% when it came to predicting whether a user's parents were still together when they were 21. People whose parents divorced before they were 21 tended to like statements about relationships. Drug users were ID'd with about 65% accuracy, smokers with 73%, and drinkers with 70%. Sexual orientation was also easier to distinguish among men, 88% right there. For women, it was about 75%. Gender, by the way, race, religion, and political views were predicted with high accuracy as well. For instance, white versus black, 95%. The findings of alarmed privacy campaigners who fear this research could be used to commercially exploit users. So keep in mind that just because you think you're not revealing a lot of personal details on Facebook, you're still spreading the word to the outside world as well as those online marketers. Volunteers with few friends liked walking with your friend and randomly pushing them into someone or something. Hey, it's not their fault they don't have friends. Everyone they know keeps getting randomly pushed into traffic. High IQ corresponds to liking Mozart, Science and the Colbert Report. Research indicated people who like Harley Davidson motorbikes are generally of low IQ. We thought we'd better offer a right to reply. I'd say our average customer is probably more intelligent than those. We certainly got a lot of customers who are people from Cambridge University for a start. By the way, don't be an idiot and think that if somebody clicked on Wicked the Musical that they're A, automatically. Or they clicked on Harley Davidson and they're stupid automatically. Ironically, that would make you stupid. One reason I think that um, our paper didn't have too much sort of uh, statistical challenge is because the machine learning methods we're using are very, very simple, you know, very standard. So it's literally, you've got users, you've got likes, you've got a matrix that's very sparse. So you do an SVD, 
I reduce it to 100 components, and then either linear or logistic regression based on those 100 components. Um, so, you know, there's not any deep learning magic going on. There's not, you know, too many parameters and things like that. You know, it's very kind of standard stuff um, in order to make these predictions. Um, here's the kinds of accuracy. So these are the, uh, the ones and the zeros. So, um, you know, uh, Christianity versus Islam, 82% of the time. If you've got someone who like, uh, not likes, uh, someone who's a Christian, someone who is a Muslim, you look at their Facebook likes, then 82% of the time the algorithm correctly says which is which. Um, and these are the correlations, Pearson correlations, for um, the uh, just non-binary results. Um, okay. Um, a couple of years later, we did something that may or may not be a li little bit more fancy, but not very, very much. Um, basically, instead of doing an SVD, we did a lasso regression instead, and that improved our accuracy somewhat. Um, so being the good researchers that we are, we published another paper about that. Um, but we're also looking at how accurate is the computer compared to the ability of other people to make the same prediction. So if I say, well, the, you know, the, the score of the computer is correlated this much with someone's real score, it's a bit hard for us to say, well, what does that really mean? How accurate is that in reality? Um, but then if you say, well, if you get someone's friend, you know, if you ask my friend, is David extroverted or introverted, they're going to have a certain level of accuracy. And then we're comparing the ability for the computer to make that prediction for a friend to make that same prediction. Um, so we started with work colleagues. Um, the work colleague correlation, 0.27, pretty low. That's the same as having nine Facebook likes. So if you know nine things that someone likes on Facebook, then the computer can predict their big five personality as accurately as a work colleague, um, which probably says something about, you know, we spend eight hours a day with these guys, but we don't really talk about anything that serious, and you don't really find out necessarily what your work colleagues are really like. Um, so we've got friends here. Friends are the same as about 65 Facebook likes. Family is the same as about 125 Facebook likes. Um, and then you've got the computer's average accuracy. So um, in 2015, the average person had 225 Facebook likes, um, which, as you can see, is almost as accurately as someone's spouse. So the sort of, you know, the, the media headline is the computer knows you as well as your husband or wife, at least in terms of making a prediction about your big five personality. Okay. Um, this is the kind of the practical part of the talk. What should you like on Facebook in order to convince our algorithm that you're intelligent? Um, so we found intelligence, uh, things correlated with intelligent, you know, very happy that science was there, and I'm a nerd, so Lord of the Rings and things like that. Um, and you guys are far too smart to know what any of these things on the right are. Uh, this is for agreeableness. So agreeableness is people who are kind of uh, interested in the social welfare. Um, so they're kind of kind, trusting, might get taken advantage of, as you can imagine, if you're very kind and trusting, versus people who are more competitive, the kind of person who tells you it like they see it. So they're not going to sugarcoat it for you. You know, If this is their opinion, they'll tell you their opinion, uh, which is really important in many cases. So you know, it's not ideal to have high or low agreeableness. Um, but here are the things correlated. So high agreeableness correlated with a bunch of Facebook behaviors linked to either religious stuff or charitable stuff. Um, low agreeableness, people uh, hate the police, they hate everyone, they hate you as well, just in case you weren't sure. Um, and it turns out the devil does wear Prada after all. Um, so the, you know, the, there's some sort of face validity for some of these things as well. You know, it makes sense on the face of it. OK. Um, as researchers, we're keen on people um, having an idea what their data is saying about them as well. You know, the more people can interact with it, the more they sort of internalize, well, what does this really mean to someone like me? Um, so we have a website where you can go along, you click the orange predict my profile button, it logs you in with, well, you log in with Facebook, it takes your Facebook likes, and it says, well, based on this data, we think you're extroverted or intelligent or uh, whatever it is. Um, it also tells you which of your likes are the ones that are driving that prediction. So if it says you're extroverted, it says, well, here are the top three likes that suggest that you're extroverted. So you can go along and see what's happening a little bit behind the scenes. 
OK. Um, similar kind of thing. Um, I showed you the word clouds at the beginning. We did the same thing with status updates. So um, those sort of short messages that you write to your friends. Um, so these are the words most correlated with being female and the words most correlated with being male. Um, so it's sort of, uh, it's, 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 it's not an ideal outcome for me. It would be nice if it was a little bit less stereotypical, to be honest. Um, but the data shows that women talk about shopping and men use a lot of swear words and talk about computer games. Um, matches the stereotypes and matches the data as well. Um, you can do the same thing for personality traits. So this is extroversion. So extroverts are talking about parties and having a blast and an amazing time and all that kind of stuff. And introverts are talking about uh, computers and the internet and anime and various Japanese manga um, uh, kind of stuff. Uh, I think there's two more. So this is emotionally stable people, so people who don't get stressed out very much. Now, no one talks about not getting stressed out, but what they talk about is the activities and the things that they're doing in their lives, whereas people who are less emotionally stable are using a lot of swear words, um, as well as you know, sick of, feeling lonely, things like that as well. So again, there's some sort of face validity. OK. Um, this is just to show we looked at self-reported um, personality scores. And we looked at the scores predicted from language. And then we looked at, do those scores correlate with things you'd, that you'd expect them to correlate? So for example, extroverts, you'd expect people who are extroverted to have more friends. So the question is, if we measure personality through language, do, do the extroverts, according to their language, actually have more friends? Um, if this was perfectly along the 45 degree line, then self-report would be working in the same way as um, you know, sort of big data reported, uh, digital footprints reported, let's say. And in general, these were uh, pretty close. So this was two. I think this was the worst one, and this was one of the better ones. Um, so in general, um, the sort of the, uh, the, the personality predicted from digital footprints is not just predicting the noise, it's predicting the signal that's actually correlated with future behavior. OK. Um, so very quickly, so how has this been applied or could be implied, applied in practice? Um, so one of the things we said with our 2013 paper was, well, maybe this could be used in digital marketing. And to be honest, that was, you know, we'd written this paper, we got to the end, and we wanted to make it sound like it might be important one day. So we said at the end, well, given you can measure someone's personality from their big data, maybe you could personalize their marketing. Um, and, you know, honestly, we thought maybe 10 years later, a marketer might look at it and apply it. Um, and th this is basically what it would look like. So um, here's two adverts for the same product. And the product is makeup, so cosmetics. Um, and basically, the one at the left is cosmetics for extroverts. So it's a, a woman dancing, dance like no one's watching. So dance like a crazy person, but they totally are. So you're the center of attention. This is kind of the dream for an extrovert. Uh, whereas the introverted one is beauty doesn't have to shout. It's a woman looking in the mirror. It's about her self-perception. It's more contemplative. It's not about what anyone else thinks. So you've got the same product, but marketed in different ways to different psychologies. Um, we did a trial where um, we worked with a company to actually put these adverts out. And basically, what you find is that people um, click on adverts that match their psychology more often. And they also buy more stuff once they've actually clicked. So we track them all the way through to the website uh, and you know, through the shopping basket and all that kind of stuff. And just giving people this first impression that this is cosmetics for someone like me means that they, um, you know, as I say, they click more. And when they click more, they buy more stuff as well. Um, OK, so this is then getting into, well, what is this? Uh, you know, uh, it's been pretty low stakes, and suddenly this is the highest stakes I'm going to talk about. Um, so there was a, a company called Cambridge Analytica who was working for the Trump presidential campaign, or who eventually worked for them after working for some of the other um, Republican contenders before that. Um, and after the election, they came out and they said, well, we did this psychographic advertising. So a bit like demographic, but psychological. 
um, this psychographic advertising, and we were basically sending adverts to um, take advantage of people's weaknesses. Um, so if you predict that someone is more likely to be a fearful person, then you start telling them about, well, when all the immigrants come, you're going to lose your job, what's that going to mean for your family? They're really kind of playing up on those fears. Um, or if you look like you're going to be a Democrat voter, instead of trying to persuade you, um, they would just kind of try and demoralize you to get you to stay at home instead. So it wasn't a sort of a, you know, uh, whatever you think of Trump's politics, you know, there's an argument that if you're just trying to get them to, if you're trying to convince them that the Republicans would be good for them, then that's one thing. But if you're just trying to get them out of the democratic process uh, completely by um, sort of uh, making them feel helpless or whatever it is, then that's a very negative way of doing it. Um, okay. So, okay, so as I say, so natural inclination for fear or disengaging voters by using big data about people, finding out what their weaknesses are, and then taking advantage of those to send messages. Um, so maybe at the end we can talk about, um, you know, you, you might ask some questions about, well, would this actually have affected the result? And I've got some opinions about that. Um, but whether it affected the past result, um, it doesn't mean that it won't be important in future. Um, so that's another matter. Okay, so final thing. Um, as I say, I'm in a business school, so I talk to future business leaders. And I think one of the important things is to teach, well, how can you use big data in a way that makes comf uh, customers comfortable? Because what this essentially is, is once you can measure what makes someone unique, you can more effectively persuade them to do something. And you can persuade them to do something against their interests, or you can persuade them to do something that is uh, in tune with their interests. So you might try to persuade them to, um, you know, your doctor says take these pills, and we're going to persuade you to actually take the full course of the pills and not stop halfway. Um, things like that. So you can persuade for positive things. Um, so how do you work with, you know, what should companies be doing with the data? I think these are the four things. So, well, at least four things. So do customers, do your customers understand what is being done with their data? So are you being transparent? Here's what we're doing. Do they have control over it? Have they opted in? Do they have the ability to opt out any time they want, you know, by just clicking a button? Um, do, is what you're doing, does it make sense to the customer? So when you explain I'm taking this data and then I'm making that prediction, does it actually make sense that these two things should be linked? And finally, is this actually a beneficial to the customer rather than um, just to the company? Um, so, you know, maybe this sounds like, well, um, you know, this would be a nice dream, but actually companies have got all the power over the data, so this would, you know, never be uh, something that happens. Um, so last thing, so we did um, a very small kind of proof of concept with SAP, who are redoing their recruitment, and one of the things they were asking is, well, can we use someone's Facebook data as part of our recruitment process? And immediately, you and us at the time, uh, sort of red flags, um, uh, you know, red lights going off or whatever it is, um, thinking, well, I don't want to not get a job offer because of something that's on my Facebook, or I don't want to not be giving a job interview because of something that's on my Facebook. Um, so we thought about how can you twist that around in a way that using someone's Facebook data is actually a benefit to them, as well as being transparent, control, etc. Um, so what we did was we made this app where as a person who's interested in working in SAP, you go along to the app, you click the button, it shares your data uh, with the app. The app then returns to you, here's where we think you would fit best into SAP. So given it's a huge, huge company, and it's very difficult from the outside to say, well, where should I fit? Um, it says, well, you would fit, we think, best here, based on your Facebook data. And then there's a button that says, do you want to go and make an application? Um, so the data is not used as part of the decision. It's not used to sort of, you know, I don't know, be used against them later on or anything like that. All it's used is a kind of a way to funnel people, making a suggestion, well, here's where we think from the outside that it will best fit for you. And I think that keeps the control in the job seeker, you know, the person whose data is actually being used. It's a benefit to them as well as benefit to the company, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's, it's, I want to be working in a place where it's going to be best for me, where I'm going to thrive, 
and the company wants me working for the same thing. So we're actually sort of working together towards the same goal. Okay. Um, all right, so that's enough for me. Let's uh, give John his chance. Where is all this research happening? I think that's the question I want to address, really. So why? Okay, well, I think the threat to democracy is effectively a perfect storm, which is why it's taken so long for everyone to understand it. Um, we were privileged, or I'm not sure what the opposite of privilege is, but we were in uh, 2012, because we were able to work with David's My Personality data. This meant we had the opportunity to see what was happening long before really it entered the public domain. Um, I say it's a perfect storm because this isn't just about big data analytics. It's not just about statistics and computer science. It actually brings together a lot of what are apparently unrelated areas. Market segmentation, micro-targeting, behavioral science and nudging, the psychologist, behavioral economics, disruption of social media, the way in which um, people chase virality, particularly journalists these days, rather than the value of the news. Um, the system makes them do it. Uh, and machine learning and AI. And finally, where is it happening in cyberspace? Well, what's that? So these are the threads which I'm trying to put together. I'm not going to talk about the first two because I'm assuming you guys here uh, know all about that already. And I'm not talking about the second two because David just talks about those. So I want to talk about behavioral science and nudging, about psychometrics and about cyber action in particular. Uh, why am I doing this or why me? Um, my first degree in 1970, which is a long time ago, was in statistics, computing and uh, psychology. Um, I did a MA in philosophy and I did my PhD in psychogenetics and psychophysiology. I started a cognitive science journal in the middle of the 1980s. And I think today it's fairly clear that cyber science is effectively cognitive psychology migrated into cyberspace. So I hope that um, this has given me a position to actually try and get all of this together. And today I make that my mission really to try and get more people to fit there. What are we looking at? Well, Big Brother Watch is on to this, of course. There are two futures here. Uh, there's a utopia. I've taken B.F. Skinner's Walden too. Uh, B.F. Skinner was a famous behavioral scientist. He was actually one of the founders of the science of behaviorism, which psychology was for a while. He believed that the perfect society, utopia, would consist of when everyone was conditioned to behave better and more properly. Utopian society is possible, but through behavioral engineering, Human beings are sometimes selfish, greedy, and mean. Human nature must be changed, engineered so that people are non-competitive, happy, and harmonious. Positive rewards can change both outward behavior and inner motives. Uh, in exactly the same year, George Orwell published 1984, uh, which takes rather a rather more dismal view of the future. Uh, for after all, how do we know that two and two makes four, or that the force of gravity works, or that the past is unchangeable? If both the past and the external world exist only in the mind, and if the mind itself is controllable, what then? Uh, B.F. Skinner worked with rats and pigeons, of course. He applied all of this to human. He even had a model of human language behavior. But essentially, most of the work was about conditioning. He showed, for example, that intermittent reward, that is, you don't give someone a reward every time they press the trigger, but only occasionally, increased the rate of learning. So it was a fundamental model of how learning works in both animals and humans. It was also the origin of a, one of the most popular forms of behavior therapy today, cognitive behavioral therapy, where you take people's ideas and try and change the way they think. So your depressed person turns up, and you're, you're the clinician. He says, life is not worth living. I might as well kill myself. You say, no, tomorrow will be better. Do not kill yourself. Think positive things. Um, everything may be getting better. Conditioning. And of course, it works. I get trouble with this slide suggesting it doesn't. But of course, there's the question of who decides what counts as a thought disorder or a maladaptive behavior. 
um, certainly during um, Stalin's Russia, you could be sent to the gulag, sent to a psychiatric hospital in Siberia for a defined mental illness of not being able to see the obvious advantages of the communist system. So it has two sides of this sort. Uh, it is, of course, the origin of behavioral economics as well, the Nudge uh, Initiative. Um, Thaler, who recently got a Nobel Prize for this work, wrote a seminal book, Improving Decisions About Health, Wealth, and Happiness, 2008. Um, the idea is something called soft paternalism, to encourage people to remedy what's called incorrect behavior by covert means. So great, um, you're not saving enough for retirement. The government should persuade you in whatever way they can. Stop eating so much junk food. Stop work smoking. That clearly worked, didn't it? Stop getting, not getting vaccinated. Don't use too much energy and recycle your rubbish. This was adopted by the British government and fairly widely throughout the world. The House of Lords report on nudges said that nudges prompt choices without people getting, getting people to consider their options consciously and therefore do not include openly persuasive interventions such as media campaigns, i.e. they are not open, they are subversive to your way of thinking. They're trying to manipulate you, but all, of course, for your own good. And the Cabinet Office 2014 defines the Behavioural Insights Team, often called the Nudge Unit, for some reason they don't like that word anymore, applies insights from academic research in behavioural economics and psychology to public policy and services. So uh, the government, using these uh, scientific techniques, can help those at risk to make sure you eat properly, you have a healthy lifestyle, and you don't get depressed. And they can prevent dangerous behaviours, such as bad driving, taking drugs, or bullying others. I think that's a child's picture of someone being bullied. Quite sweet. Or, of course, they can tackle those who place others at risk. Um, you can try and condition criminals, terrorists, cybercriminals, sex offenders, and fraudsters to behave better, or at very least to find out who they are in order that you can perhaps persuade them to behave better in other ways, such as incarcerating them. So we have the brave new world of Aldous Huxley, 1932, turned into a possible reality. Uh, he wrote Brave New World Revisited in, uh, I think, 1955. Um, I would suggest that it's about time we revisited Brave New World again. It's an excellent book. Today, um, what else can we do to help the nudge? We can take records of health, education, crime, all your tax records, your credit card ratings, your spending habits from Tesco or Sainsbury's, Travel records, your work records, genealogy on your genes that you put on Ancestry.com, what you're doing on the internet, your mobile phone locations and webcams. And to make this far more efficient, we should, of course, join all these databases together. Uh, I think most people now realise that might not be such a good idea because these databases actually leak. So to the extent they've already been developed by Western governments, copies of them almost certainly exist in Tehran and Moscow and Beijing. But if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. Thank you, William Hague. Right, that's the first strand I'm going to go through of the perfect storm, because that's there. We're all supporting it. It's been with us for 10 years now. Psychometrics in the online age... Psychometrics is about predicting. You can take someone's psychometric footprint and psychometricians can treat the words you like on Facebook, as David has explained, as items in an IQ or personality test. The only difference now is you don't need to give anyone the questionnaire and the items are larger. You've got, say, a billion possible questions you could have asked, but you've got enough items to make the same predictions you do from an digital footprint that you can give from a psychometric test. Whoops, okay, well, I've moved on. So can we learn anything from the history of psychometrics, um, which has had a rather cloudy history, as I'm sure some of you know, to perhaps see where the dangers lie here from the psychometric point of view? 
Psychometric prediction started over 2,000 years ago in the emperor's court in China, where testing procedures which were reliable and valid and judged as such in the same similar way as today were introduced to select the civil service. And of course, today, they're the basis of our examination system, particularly the SATs. They were set about or set on with the best of intentions, meritocracy, led to the universities choosing the people most likely to benefit society or gain from their learning, moved away from an education system based on money and uh, family. Uh, they introduced IQ tests. They were used for recruitment in the First World War. And they're the basis of our examination system. The unintended consequences, of course, are it could be used for discrimination, eugenics, you use IQ tests to decide who should be sterilized, who might be allowed to immigrate into America at Ellis Island. Um, and uh, these are all examples of the use of intelligence tests for both of these purposes. And of course, um, what is fair to um, individuals, it turned out, is not fair to groups of individuals. So we saw many white people getting into universities on the basis of their IQ tests, with nobody really questioning why they were getting higher scores than IQ tests. While today, even today, there are more black Americans in prison than there are in American universities. So essentially, the psychometric revolutions of the past had intended consequences, meritocracy from examinations, diagnosis from mental tests, instant results today we get from online testing, huge advantage in the examination system, and adaptive testing uh, involved a form of um, neural network programming, which effectively you could argue, well, I would as a psychometrician, you probably disagree, with the origin of um, machine learning. The um, unintended consequences were discrimination in examinations, eugenics in mental tests, cyber insecurity has been a result of online testing, and artificial intelligence has um, been is very closely involved with the evo evolution of computer adaptive testing. Up the second thread. Um, David's talked about um, psychology, so really I should probably not waste too much time on it, other than I quite like my pictures, so I put them in, but I'll go through them quickly. So extroversion, this is the ocean system. Um, openness versus conventionalism, conscientiousness versus disorganized, extroversion versus introversion, agreeable versus tough-mindedness, and neurotic versus stable. And of course, We've all got used to the ocean system because it seems to have hit the headlines, but in fact, there are many, many other psychological traits that have been widely used. Ocean is actually in a minority in psychological literature, and some are quite old, so I've taken these from the vices and virtues that Giotto put on the Athena Chapel in Padua in 1286, I think they date from. So people differ in their temperance or their anger, they differ in their sense of justice or their um, sense of envy, and they differ in charity and greed. So all of these characteristics, as well as the big five, are all accessible from online digital footprints. These are basically based on what are called the dark triad in, um, in criminal psychology. Okay, next, what and where is cyberspace? Because I come across people who think, A, it's not important or that it doesn't exist. Um, I did Google someone who said it didn't exist, and I found this rather intriguing definition from an Italian philosopher. There is no need for cyberspace. All internet-related things can be handled with existing conceptual categories. The internet has nothing to do with technology. It's just one person talking to another using a different technology. Okay. Well, at least I've got a powerful group to support me, the UK Cybersecurity Strategy Group, who define it as an interactive domain made up of digital networks that is used to store, modify, and communicate information. It includes the internet, but also the other information systems that support our businesses, infrastructure, and services. 
That's from the UK cybersecurity strategy document in 2011. And why not go back to St. Paul, because it brings in some nice icons. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. So what is seeing through a glass darkly? Well, certainly when we look at each other through cyberspace, we do not see each other clearly. So uh, where is cyberspace? Well, there are a couple of books that probably means that you know about St. Paul's expression already. One by a book play by Mar Bergman and the book by Arthur Conan Doyle. Uh, the picture I've chosen to illustrate is actually a picture of seawater through a microscope. So uh, what I'm uh, attempting to say is that we see things indirectly. And there are things that occupy the space between one and another. Uh, they are not, in this case, these little wee beasties, which look rather intriguing. They are bots, basically, and all the other bits and trash everyone is putting there at the moment. So communication, what was supposed to happen, the intentions, was collaboration. What seems to be evolving, of course, is Big Brother is peering back through this network. Uh, cyberspace, what's here? Well, we have the Cyber Oracle. Uh, one is in Delphi, the other is in Palo Alto, I think. Mountainville. Mountainville, thank you, was it moved? Okay. We have the Cyber Babel. Uh, I understand some archaeologists believe this is the remains of the Tower of Babel. It's a ruin near Babylon, so I suppose it's plausible. Uh, we also have the Babel fish, uh, which of course was a complete fantasy during Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. But I think today, when any of you who use Google Translate will know, it's not so far off if it's not already here in one sense. So machine learning in cyberspace, lighting the fire, I call this. Uh, well, we have machine learning came from psychology in neural networks. It also comes from computer science. Prometheus uh, was a titan, and um, he seemed to have some sort of a row with Zeus, which is ill-advisable, I think. You don't usually start arguing with gods. Um, he decided that Zeus was wrong not to give fire to human beings, so he gave it to them. Rather risky behavior, you must admit. Um, so, what happened as a result? Well, we got machine learning using what you look at and search for online, where you are, what you click on, what you write in text, the images and things you paste. The machines today can learn all sorts of things and are doing so already. They can learn how much money they can, you can safely lend someone. These systems are in use by um, lending companies. <laughs> they can work out the likelihood of committing a criminal or civil offence. This is used by, in courts in America to decide how long to sentence people from. You can use them um, with adverts to maximize your ROI. David described a system that actually did maximize your ROI, but okay, why not have genetic algorithms that start shifting around your adverts and only put out the ones which the, the genetic algorithms show are more successful? They can learn to do that. And of course, they can learn what news to show you to make you change your mind. And they can respond to masses of people simultaneously in real time. Another strand, psychology of moral development. Uh, psychologists know about Piaget and Kohlberg, theories of moral development. Uh, there's a condition called psychopathic personality disorder, which amounts to inhibited moral development. Psychopaths apparently do not become morally mature. They stop developing at age 11. So they have no proper mor way of making moral judgments. As a result, they have an inability to experience remorse or shame. This leads to the rather intriguing moral paradox because they're supposed to be cognitively inferior. That is, they have an undeveloped moral sense. They can't experience the remorse and shame, but on the other hand, they seem to be particularly good at manipulating it in other people. So you don't need to experience it in order to manipulate it. 
Now, we've always assumed, or not, we haven't always, some people have. It's assumed generally that machines are super cognitive beings. They can play chess, go, and all sorts of clever things. But for emotions, leave that to human beings. You need human beings to do the cancelling. If we go back to these situations, the machines are not learning cognitive things. They're actually learning to understand human emotions. That's what your machine learning algorithms are using. They're trying to work out someone's personality, someone's psychological state in order to predict what they're going to do. And it turns out they're actually much better at it than human beings. I wouldn't say machines are psychopaths because they have no way of knowing any difference. But then a psychiatrist would argue, well, neither have psychopaths. They're not responsible for their actions because they have an illness. So this has led, I think, increasingly to cons concern about what's called XAI, explaining AI. As a society, we must be able to look inside the black box of big data analytics in order to ensure that any particular analytic applications can be safely installed and will benefit all of us. Uh, today, this is the real challenge, because unless we do it soon, we're going to have serious problems. Oh, yes, here's our piece of seawater. Who lives in cyberspace? Well, we're all here collaborating, so we're all doing that. We did that to the internet with email. Okay, and now we have little likes and tweets and emoticons. And we, of course, had a second life, uh, which seems to have gone out of favor, but that was all there. Uh, I don't think many people would disagree that when you actually look into what's in cyberspace, it doesn't actually reflect very well on human beings. We seem to be very good at promoting bad, horrible things about people, and not that good at doing the good things. So arguably, from a psychologist's point of view, the first bit of the human being to migrate into cyberspace is actually the id monster. Uh, it's already there, and it will shortly be followed by AI. Okay? So we're now all following the Pied Piper with great enthusiasm. We're all people like you, desperate to change the world. But it's about time we thought a bit more of what the world is being changed into and perhaps put some structure in space to make it work. Zeus's revenge on Prometheus was, of course, Pandora's box, which unleashed all the evils on the world. And there was only one thing left in it when all the evils had escaped, which, of course, was hope. So this is really part of the wake-up call that me and many others are trying to put out at the moment. There's a fine line between faith and foolishness, standing on the railway tracks in a darkened tunnel and believing the light heading your way to be an angel sent from heaven is an act of faith. Ignoring the warning whistle of the freight train, believing it to be the angel Gabriel, Gabriel broving his horn, the singularity, is just plain foolish. Thank you very much. Hi there. I guess it's a question to both of you, really. Um, I had a talk here not so long ago about sort of ethics and the law and the impact um, of AI. So I guess the question is, there's some scary stuff in there, especially around, you know, discrimination, maybe, you know, price discrimination, preventing people from buying insurance if your Facebook profile shows that you're, you know, an undesirable. Do you think more is going to be needed in those sort of areas to, you know, stop business discriminating against people, for example? That's a tough question. Do you want to start? <laughs> I, I, it, it, it's, it's a good question. So, um, the question is, will, will companies go so far in a way that it ends up being bad for society is, is kind of the, the thing. Um, eventually, it's possible. Um, I don't think we're at a stage right now where you can use the big data and it's such a good prediction that you know, there won't still be people willing to insure you know, various groups. Um, but, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's not... Uh, yeah, I, I, think it's, I think it's a long way off before it's got such a predictive power that it sort of reaches this point where 
you know, people would be uninsurable. Um, but I mean, you, you, can, you can argue along the way there, it's already sort of uh, a negative outcome because, you know, why should someone have to pay more because they, they did something on Facebook? Um, on the other hand, you can argue, why should I have to pay, you know, to subsidize someone who's a thrill-seeking crazy guy when he's behind the wheel? Um, you know, so sort of fairness is, is on the other side as well. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure where I sit with that personally. Um, I'm gonna, <laughs> yeah, I, I think we're a very diverse center in the psychometric center. We come from all over the world and different things. Um, diff David and I have a different point of view on that, that I have great respect for his because it assumes that everybody is very sensible and really wants to know what it means to click with someone. If you just let them know that how the data is going to be used, they'll be able to make a proper decision about which way to vote or what to buy. Um, actually, most of this stuff tries to undermine, I think, our cognitive structures. It's emotionally directed. We're not even aware that it's going on. And increasingly, the machine learning algorithms will make far more money and the ROI will go shooting up if they try and produce messages which people don't understand. Uh, I think it's a very serious danger, yeah. I'm intrigued why you think this is bad. Um, when I listen to, to the talks this evening, I have one thing where an undergraduate, as you, or just a graduate, as you were at that point in time, was able to do all these things. Obviously a bright undergraduate, but one <laughs> undergraduate on his own. Um, are we not in a world where, I mean, my teenagers do this. They knock up stuff that goes around the internet doing things automatically. Um, they're not um, particularly politically aligned. Um, they could easily take those things and under my tutorage will, when they apply to university and jobs, have profiles which show them to be nice, caring, intelligent people. These things are, are demonstrably easy to hack. Um, I'd also just like to share a conversation I had in the House of Commons um, beginning of last week where the, the Conservative Party has a working group on identity, where we've gathered together the banks, uh, the credit rating agencies, various bits of government, people like that. And when someone suggested joining up the government databases, there just was laughter, because they are, and I speak as someone who designed one of them, government databases are garbage. <laughs> you only have to go to the DVLC or to the HMRC. They, they don't know what the systems do. The idea that w all we have to do is write a clever bit of SQL and they will join is, ma makes Mr. Spock look, look, look quite realistic. I mean, where is the threat surface here? All that's happened is that people who some people don't like got elected and we now have a crisis of democracy. Um, what, what crisis? Do you want to start? Oh, well, I wouldn't say we're saying it's bad. I think it's just happening. Um, we, after all, are doing a lot of the major research in the area. Uh, no, it's not that it's bad. It's just it's undirected, and it's completely out of control. <coughs> it may be good, but lots of things aren't good, you know. The Second World War came about because Hitler was out of control. This is definitely not good. <laughs> so, OK, so, so on the... Second point, um, uh, I, I am a, so, so you know, one reason I say I don't think this is something that is, is the end of the world now is, is because I'm definitely a believer that um, in the main, both companies and government um, aren't as smart as we assume they are. <laughs> um, so you sort of think, well, X company has got all this data, surely they're doing the fancy stuff and then when those companies come to us and start talking about what they want to do, it turns out they're, you know, at least 10 years behind what's possible to do. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not heading in that direction and that both government and companies are getting better. Um, so there's some really sort of uh, alarming or interesting, depending on how you look at it, stuff in China right now where they're doing facial recognition, and there was some stories in the media that people went to a beer festival when the Chinese government um, looked at facial recognition of everyone who came, and they found a bunch of people that had been on the run for 10 years. Now, is that a great thing, or is that a little bit, you know, sort of alarming when you think about how else could it be used? 
So I, I guess, yeah, for me, it's sort of, it's about the direction of travel and uh, do we want to make sure that direction of travel is, is the way it's going? Um, so on, on the first question, uh, isn't it possible just to cheat these algorithms? Um, yeah. um, yes, it's definitely possible. I think it's the way to think of it is like an arms race, though. So right now, you've got a lot of data on various social networks where people haven't really um, necessarily thought when they're posting these things, what might it mean for the long run? So now they come to get a job and they start looking back at those other things. But then the algorithm designers go, well, we know that people are lying. You know, first of all, they were lying on their CVs. Now they're lying on Facebook. So they move on to some other piece of data. And the question is, who's in the lead? Is it the people who are um, sort of uh, you know, trying to find out what we're really like? Or is it the people who are able to um, sort of stymie those attempts? And uh, you know, the, the risk is who, who's always going to be in front, even if you can cheat it, can you cheat it quickly enough? Uh, with that in mind and all you've just said, um, do you think GDPR goes far enough in terms of user control, transparency, relevance, and benefits? I mean, these data sets we can get hold of now, but I mean, when you look at GDPR, it's going to be much harder to, to do that. I personally am a big fan of GDPR, um, especially the right about um, automated data processing and being able to ask, why have you made this decision? I want to, um, uh, you know, give an opinion that's not against, uh, you know, that's against this automated decision, um, things like that. Also, I'm a fan of data portability, so dating, taking the data from one company and taking it to someone else. Um, uh, I have this little niggling feeling that it won't be as perfect as we hope when it comes into practice. So as I say, I'm a fan of data portability. So right now, you know, uh, I'm stuck on Facebook. If I wanted to use another social network, I can't take my data out of Facebook and put it somewhere else. Um, so data portability sounds like the answer. But then when you look in the detail, my understanding is the company has a month to give you your data when you ask for it. So it's not quite as easy as I go to Facebook, say, give me my data, and I take it immediately somewhere else. It's, well, I'm thinking of changing social network. Maybe in a month's time, I can do it. Um, and those little details like that suddenly put you know, sticks in the spokes of the wheel and make it hard for it to actually work in practice. Um, and my concern, there'll be more of those. So you know, describing how does my data, uh, how does my algorithm, how has it made its decision? Um, that hasn't been defined how you're going to explain to someone that this is how the decision has been made. So you can imagine companies just going, well, you know, we took this data, we put it through a um, deep learning algorithm, and here's the decision it's made, and that's your explanation. And that's not really telling you how they've made the decision. So, you know, again, the kind of the devil's in the detail. Yeah, it, I think it's an important start. Uh, I think uh, it's forcing people to think about the issues. It's causing all the organizations having to get ready for it to prepare a structure for it. Um, I think the people, people realize that it can't really function as a sort of bureaucracy which is envisaged. The important thing is that people try and meet them. I see it more as the beginning of a set of um, discussions, ongoing evolutionary policy and regulation. But yes, um, but you have to start somewhere. The danger is it'll turn into a bu bureaucratic nightmare uh, we just hope that the people who are involved in it, running it, don't see it as a sort of jobs worth exercise and see it as an exploration, really, of the issues that are really important and the ways which actually we could safely ignore. Well, given the time, um, I'd like to thank you all for attending. Um, this space is available for the next 20 minutes or so, so if the speakers are willing and able to stay around, then uh, feel free to continue the conversation. But we should um, finish by thanking the speakers once again for their excellent presentation. Thank you.